before I start, any questions about what we talked about on Monday? Anybody process? Anybody sit there and go, wow, I've never thought of that before. How many of you have heard Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of uh, organized and presented in this way? Right. I apply it differently because I've applied consciousness to it and evolutionary psychology is how this class was put together. Looking at Darwin's theory, evolutionary psychology has been applied to a ton of areas in the field of physiology, um, psychology, sociology, how we function as social beings in social environments, as a culture, and when it comes to health and wellness, can you take that out? Can you even take it out? Right. I don't believe you can. So applying it this way, I think what it, what it provides is a observation of human behavior with context, right? Because the way that we are typically taught about health and wellness is individual. You as an individual, right? You, are you motivated to do what you need to do? Can you change your diet to be the way it needs to be? What is your resting heart rate, right? What's your VO2 max? How do you perform? How do we measure performance, right? In a vacuum, when you get into the weight loss industry, when you get into the nutrition industry, when you get to the health and fitness industry, when you're in the healthcare industry, you're typically trained to think from not a broad population health, or broad kind of social or evolutionary perspective around how this person might be suffering from some type of outcome, right? And the, we're not just talking about disease or chronic ailment. We're talking about the outcome of lack, lacking motivation. How do you get someone to be motivated? If you've got someone willing to give you money and they have goals for physical outcomes, it's really easy based on your training to go, I have all the answers. When in fact, if you don't, you don't, neither do I, neither do I. Okay. So that's not a put down. It's really a fact. We don't know until you're in the place with this person working with where they're coming from, what they have in the moment. And it changes all the time because of what we're going to talk about today. I am going to really do my best to go through this and not get distracted, okay? So what is survival mode? What do you guys think before looking at all the things? When you think about survival mode, what do you think? It would be like your dream, almost like primal instinct. Like if you're in survival mode, hmm. would it be kind of like a fight or flight type of deal? That's exactly what it is. Okay. Yeah. I like that you said primal instinct. Um, and it is con constant. It's actually really important uh, part of our consciousness um, as a species. As any species really is how to sustain behavior that is required for you to perpetually maintain a degree of consciousness. What are the behaviors we have to have to stay conscious, to stay alive? What are behaviors... What are things that we need to be afraid of be, that might be threatening, that might be harmful? You know, how we perceive our reality, everything is based on survival. Everything. Down to how your proprioceptors are measuring pressure and how you, I mean, down to all the mechanisms, everything is based on what's important to maintain and sustain equilibrium. Homeostasis is about this. Survival. So good answer. Anybody else have anything to add? Please just speak up too. Like you don't have to raise your hand in here. I am so informal. So it's a physiological adaptation to how our body, um, in our body that occurs in response to perceived threat. So this is really important. Perceived threat. How, what, and how, and how much you perceive something as potentially threatening. Potential. We experience this stress as stress and agitation. So there's a physiological 
response, right? What is that physiological response? How many of you want to pipe up and what are things that happen when you're in fight or flight in survival mode? Does it make your adrenaline get much higher? Yep. Cortisol Yes, adrenaline, cortisol. What do those things do? It's a sympathetic nervous system. I don't expect you to know all this, but you're right. Yeah, you're getting it uh, improves blood pressure to shunt blood to the working muscles. It changes how we think. It literally changes how we conscient how our brains process information. How many of you have been in a fight where you couldn't remember words? You couldn't remember what you were going to say. You're saying things out of order. You're shaking. How many of you have done a presentation where you're like, right? How many of you have had that experience? That's biological, right? In, let's just use a presentation setting. Why would that trigger a fight or flight reaction? What's the threat? Apply Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In a presentation, what perception of threat, what's being threatened? What hierarchy of need is that? Is it? Yes, it's love and belonging. And you could say esteem as well, because if you don't have the competence, you're going to be, made, and that competence is connected to worth, that is going to potentially trigger that biological reaction. That is how important human connection is. Something as simple as presenting can stimulate cortisol. Um, take your, you're not meant in fight or flight to sit and be calm and think it through and look at all the risks and you're not meant to process like that. You're meant to do something, hide, shrink, inflate, right? So sources of stress, threat to one's access to food, water, sleep, safety, health care, self-defense, job security, belonging, intimacy, family, friends, community, right? So I'm really going into the first three hierarchies of need that might spread into that fourth one, which would be esteem. This is the old one, right? I did not include. This was just pretty. So keep in mind, this was from 1955. What you just got te tested on was the 1972 version that adds cognitive um, aesthetic, thank you, self-actualization and transcendence, which is more the higher levels of human functioning. I would like to think this first five that he published in 1955 using the Blackfoot Nations concept, I want to make sure you know that, um, these are for the most part still fight flight spaces. Self-actualization, you're not in it anymore. So again, he expanded here. Those are the same. So basic physiological needs, we've already gone over that. We're going to keep on going. You already know this one. You already know this one. You know this one. Oh my God. I did not realize I read it all these. Okay. Oh, okay. Now we're in the good stuff. You need to remember this. So if you're going to take any type of mental note, this conversation right here is very important because what you, what research is looking at is how, how do we receive information conscientiously and cognitively and intellectually that would trigger cortisol, epinephrine, that would shunt blood towards our extremities, that would take digestion and shut it down. Just what we perceive can have that reaction. It doesn't have to be a truthful threat. If you just believe it's threatening, biological reaction. You just got to believe it, even if it's not real, right? What does it take to trigger survival mode? There, it requires that you have a self-evaluation first. What are you capable of? It, it, you cannot have a trigger unless you feel that you cannot handle something. An inner assessment of one's capacity. There has to be a comparison. There is what I can handle compared to what this is. 
whether it's lose my job, can't pay my bills. What if I don't pass the class? What if I don't get an A? What if no one likes me? What if I can't eat? What if it's too cold out and I freeze to death, right? So you're comparing yourself to something else. It doesn't just happen. You don't just have anxiety. That doesn't just happen. You're not a mouse. You're not, you're not just, oh, I'm full of anxiety. No, you actually have so much going on that results. I have a result of anxiety. A self-evaluation compared to a trigger. And there's an assumption you can't handle it. That's the key. I cannot handle it. Make sense? So when I ask you, what does it require to trigger stress, fight or flight? This isn't a bad thing. This is just the equation. This is how it works for every single person. It requires that you compare your sense of capacity to an external stimulus. It equates to the assumption, I can't handle it, reaction, okay? Um, is there anything else on this one? Now, if you can handle the hardship, it is with help. So, so let's say the assumption is you can't handle it. I think I need to be more clear with this one. If you can't handle the hardship, do you have something that could help? So let's use something really obvious. I'm in the wilderness. I'm like connecting with the trees and holy shit, there's a bear. There's a freaking bear. Uh, it's clearly bigger than me. Its body language is coming at me and I look delicious. And there's a clear assessment of my lack of capacity and also memory around stories of people getting eaten by bears, right? So there's history, there's the assessment. Then, um, but I have whoosh, bear spray. Whoosh. I'm going to feel real good with that bear spray. Can you see how bear spray or a handgun or something to protect myself would probably diminish that response? So having some sense of tool is really important too. So, okay, I can't, I can't handle this or, okay, let's use schooling. I'm going to take this class. It might be really hard. Well, what are the tools you have? I'm going to get a tutor. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to go to every class. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to read the material. I'm going to do the best I can. What if I fail? Well, the question is, can you handle that? A lot of people's assumption would be, no, I can't. Well, if you can't, then what are you going to live in during that course? Anxiety and stress. Well, let's think it through. What if you do your best with what you have, what you're handling in your life, and you fail? Think it through. Can you handle that? What would you do in this situation? Any class, you fail. You did your best under, under the circumstance you had, whether it's working a job, being an athlete, um, parent, parent got sick, you're overloaded, you don't have enough time, you fail the class. Now what? What are you going to do? Can you handle it? None of you can handle it. Not one of you can handle that. I would think that you take the class and you know not have not be working, not you know cut out the things that would stress you out, so you're not completely not that. Right, you probably do it under. You'd retake it. Retake. How hard was that? Having to retake it. Could you handle it? Could you handle retaking the class? Yeah. Would you? Now you taking the class, you can understand it better, right? If you, if you can't work through the handling of it, you are going to have higher stress loads. If you can process forward and think, well, how would I handle that stress, that not best case scenario, that's kind of a worst case scenario situation, being able to get a sense of handling things really changes how our bodies respond in reality. Okay. Okay. Keep on going here. So here is a quick biological, you guys are going to learn this in another class, not this one. 
But just know how you perceive reality based on your beliefs, based on what you, your experiences, based on um, past experience. There is this position around what's reality in front of you versus what your history has and what your sense of self can handle is processing that information and either saying, I think I can handle that or I'm not sure I can handle that. Then there's a biological reaction that makes you feel vulnerable. It's a physiological sense. The sympathetic nervous system, and we're going to come back to this, but one of the most important um, pieces of information is it completely shuts down your digestive system. It completely shuts down salivation, gastric digestion, peristalsis, which is the smooth muscle, muscle contractions to get your fl uh, food to move, increases heart rate, changes your eyesight. So when you're in fight or flight, you're eyes don't function the same. Your ears don't function the same. Here it is. Bam, bam, bam. Tunnel vision, racing heart, sweating, increased breath, hair standing up, tight chest, stomach pain, loss of appetite, drinking difficulty, dread, impulse to do something. How many of you have felt some of this? Right. Every single person here should on some level experience dread. How many of you dreaded the semester? Right? I'm with you. Because you know it's challenging. You might have a class that totally puts you in a position of like, I, oh, too much work. The balancing act, being a full-time student, especially if you're working full-time. Dread. Don't forget finals, right? Finals last semester. How many of you were in school full-time last semester and took finals? How did that feel? How did it feel? It's exhausting, not getting enough sleep. You're going to have it again every semester, every single semester. How did you handle it? Was it okay? Did you do all right? Right? Are you here today? Yes. And you move forward, right? But it's going to happen again. Deadlines can do that. Um, how about have any of you had to break up with someone? How would you feel about that? How did you handle that? Were you okay with it? Was it easy? Did they make it easy? Did you feel bad? Did you have remorse? Right, relationship issues. Can you afford? So when you think about how we talk about fight or flight and these physical, biological experiences, apply them to Maslow's hierarchy. You can probably go, oh yeah, this was directly related to you know my job, not being able to pay the bills, having to take out more student loans. Am I going to be able to pay for those student loans? How much pressure does that put on the, the, the tool of your diploma, right? A diploma is a tool, right? How, how well does that diploma work when it comes to putting yourself out there in a huge pool of people who have more experience than you? I mean, that can create fight or flight. It changes our perceptions, and I think this is really important so that you can recognize when your perceptions are functioning in fight or flight and how it responds. Our perception of reality becomes really tunneled in fight or flight. It's get tunneled. Our ability to think about consequences is not promoted, okay? Based on your sense of capacity to handle the threat, um, your response will be to freeze, fight, run, hide, negotiate, fawn. Fawning, do you know, guys know what fawning is? It's not just fight or flight. Fight or flight, think of it as an abbreviation of a big spectrum of responses. No one here knows what fawn is. I'm going to adapt to what they want. So let's say... Uh, but a, a real obvious fawning would be in um, like an environment where someone has power over your value, a parent, a job, employer, someone who's employing you, um, and they're telling you what you have to do to be accepted. You're going to fawn. You're going to adapt. You're going to try to fit in. Fawning is placating to their needs because they're the ones in power over your secu uh, security, okay? Um, or to accept and surrender. 
which is also a form of, uh, of um, fawning. Surrendering can be seen in different ways, depending on how you feel about it. If you're surrendering and feeling sorry for yourself, that is different than surrendering and being okay with the consequence. Does that make sense? Surrendering and being pissed about the consequence is very different than surrendering and accepting the consequence. So this is complicated, but in essence, freeze, fight. So fight means there's confidence. Freezing means you're scared, you're in paralysis. Um, running and hiding, you're competent that you can get away. You're not competent or feeling good about what's going on and that you can handle it. So you're going to try to run, escape. So that's the escape. That'd be like, you know, Boise State sucks. I'm going to go to another school. You know what? That school sucks. I'm going to get another job. You know, that job sucks. I'm going to go somewhere else. You might not be facing a reality. There's nothing wrong with changing at all. So I don't want to come across that way. But that's a response to be like, escape the situation. Uh, don't face it. Don't feel it. Instead of talking this through, I'm going to hang in the phone up. I'm going to say, I can't do this right now. Shut the door. So nothing really is happening. You're just escaping an inevitable conversation. How many of you have hung up on someone in the middle of a fight because you felt overwhelmed and couldn't handle it or left a room and slammed the door because you want to have a nonverbal communication that they suck? I mean, I've done both. Right. There's no judgment, but that's escaping. You're not competent in that moment to actually face maybe the conversation. You're holding a boundary around what you can't handle and what you can handle. It's not always wrong. That's not a bad thing. So the cognitive response to threat, here it is. I didn't say flop. Flop is, um, you know, when you see, have you guys seen the goats that, you know, they get scared and then they fall over? That's flop. Um, you could, you could see this in many ways here. So change in sight, racing heart, all the things, blah, 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 here, blah, 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 blah. Um, again, I would say fighting is there, that is definitely a space of competence. And this is generalizing here. So it's not always narcissistic to fight. It's not always a bully that fights. However, fighting is a sign that you think you can be your superior. Okay. And that can be an amazing quality. So when I found this picture, I was like, God, I wish there was like also <laughs> people who are willing to survive and figure out a solution. Um, again, Freezing is common. How many of you procrastinate or call yourself a procrastinator? That's frozen. You're frozen. Procrastination is uh, you're feeling overwhelmed and you're somewhat fleeing, but that is absolutely a survival reaction to not wanting to face whatever it is. And it might be because um, you have time. So there is a time component to procrastination. Okay. So the fight response, this means there's a positive assessment of one's ability, state of inflation, thinking you're bigger, stronger, and better than you really are good for competition and war. Um, thinking you're superior in aiming to be right. That's also very similar to survive. You're willing to steal, cheat, and hurt others. Again, I don't want to always look at this and think this is a bad thing, but typically fighters are assholes. They can be assholes. They're the ones who are constantly complaining. They're the ones who are willing to say, this isn't right. You better fix it. Karens. I love the name Karen. So please don't take that personal. The flight response, confident in ability to get away, escaping, coping, forms of getting away, avoidance, denial, cleaning, um, rep uh, repression, prevention is also a flight response. I will work out really hard so I don't gain weight. That's, that's this. Perfectionism is also a flight response because you are trying to avoid staying busy, other forms of coping and escape, alcoholism, exercise addiction, obsessive dieting or emotional eating, drug abuse, all escape. Here it is. I'm going somewhere else. 
posting on social media. I mean, there's a lot. Freeze response, paralysis, blending into the background, invisibility, procrastination is freeze, like I said. Dissociation, detaching from mind and body, shutting down, apathy. So apathy can actually go into fawning or um, different areas. Do you guys know what apathy is? Who wants to share the wealth of knowledge here? Someone, apathy. Is it, uh, like, you understand how it feels to be experiencing That is a great answer for empathy. E-M-P, yeah. Uh, where you don't emotion, you don't have emotion. Very close, very close. Apathy is hopelessness. Apathetic is what's the point? What is the point? Um, you could say before the civil rights movement, uh, black people were very apathetic towards any change. It sucked. But then they became, they kind of raised up and became willing to fight. That is a positive thing. They're coming out of hopelessness into some level of we can do something about it. That means there's hope. I'm cur There's a little bit more higher level of consciousness coming out of apathy. Apathy is like depression where you cannot go out. What is the point? Why try? It is the other side of all, the nothing. And that's hopelessness. Fawn response. You won't survive alone, so you reject yourself to instead bond with who or what you think will. So this is an important thing. Um, I won't survive, so I will become what I believe will, or I will attach myself to what will. This is the other side of codependency. Typically, a fawn response is great with a fight responder. The fight responder likes fawners because you'll do what I say. And a fawner loves to be told what to do, okay? Again, no one's all or nothing on any of these, but you'll see your own temperaments around kind of where you are on that map of consciousness around what your typical reaction is to certain types of threats. You will abandon your own needs to serve others as a way to avoid conflict. So even though this is harming me, even though this is making me super uncomfortable and it's out of really what I naturally would engage with, I will do it because I'm fearful of rejection and abandonment. That's how I experienced sexual assault. The willfulness for me in college to have sex with someone wasn't because I wanted it or was even interested in it. It was because I was definitely afraid to be rejected. Sound familiar to any of you? How many of you want to have sex with someone who's only doing it because they're super afraid you won't like them? They don't really want to. Does that sound fun? That's really common. This fun response is really common in the inferior position of relationships. Adapting and becoming what others like in fear of disapproval and criticism. And this is typical in codependency. Narcissists love people who fawn. They love it. I want someone who will agree with me at all times because I'm inflated and they're willing to fawn for inclusion. Flop, fainting goats, loss of physical control, grease, uh, excuse me, grief, loss is a flop response. Grief is... Um, it's a form of paralysis, but in loss. Loss of will to live. Failure is permanently altering to one's sense of self. This is really hard. Um, again, this would be the all nothing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to lose 50 pounds, and I'm going to do this ketogenic diet, and the first moment you have crackers, more so, and your ketosis levels go away or go up, and you're like, or down, Screw it, I might as well eat a whole pack of these. That's flopping. Failure. Um, irreversible damage, at least in the next 12 hours until I wake up in the morning and then it's not, then it's reversible. That's diet thinking mentality, but flopping is all nothing. So face response. This is really cool. You're going to see this picture over and over and over and over and over again. So when we talked on Monday and I was describing to you the point at which we transcend kind of the survival um, levels of consciousness, you guys remember very specifically I said the specific 
thing is what transitions you out of esteem into cognitive. What was it? Courage. courage. It is courage, the willing to face what reality is. Again, this is not something, for example, if I'm sitting in front of a bear that's coming at me that I don't grab my bear spray, right? Because we all know there are some levels of guarantee that your perception is correct. That bear is going to definitely harm me. I have tools in place. I'm not willing to face what my capacity is in wrestling a grizzly bear, right? So I want you to think of this picture, right? How would you feel as this person with this big animal in front of you? How would that feel? Yeah, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I love that answer. In that frozen state, what would you, how would you be processing? What would you be? Uh, like, what am I supposed to do? I don't know, it's scary to. Yeah. Then what? I'm asking you to go through it versus, yeah. Uh, to freeze and then probably run. Okay. Do you think running would provide any resolution? No. Okay. Just wanted that one. Are you good? Do you want to switch for someone? Or are you this good? Else was like, yeah. okay. Well, you're correct on everything. Uh, what if you were had an exception of faith that's like, well, there's nothing I can do? Yeah, I think we were getting there, kind of around the circle of like, okay, if this is my demise, right? Because remember, survival is based on life and death. It's based on death. 100%. Survival is not based on really life. It is, it is about dying. Period. Every single thing about Maslow's hierarchy, ultimately, except when you come out of cognitive and higher, everything below that is about death at all times and, and how we symbolize what death is. So when we look at this, this could be to you, what if I don't get into med school? What if my family finds out that I don't want to be a part of this religion anymore and they're going to abandon me because I'm, you know, that's their identity and then they might think I'm not good enough anymore. What if I, you know, what if my significant other is cheating on me? Feel this in more ways than just the, bio, the physical threat. Think of your perceptions of threat socially, right? Facing is the hardest thing to do. Um, accepting, because it does require a degree of acceptance that we're not sure what we can do. It takes courage to face. It takes humility, a willingness to admit, this isn't probably going to work out. Like this way of fighting, this way of fleeing, this way of like begging, fawning, pleading isn't working. When do you actually go in to what feels like death to find out what the truth is. How many of you have actually done that? With not, not literally dying. I have because I was very suicidal and actually chose to commit suicide. That was an incredible space of going into death as if it's real and happening. That changed my brain, right? But the willingness to admit this isn't working. This relationship isn't working. This religion isn't working. This job isn't working. And actually facing the loss of companionship, community, conditional acceptance, right? Acceptance only under conditions, um, financial loss and hardship, having to go to the government to have assistance. How many of you have had to go to the government for assistance to live? You don't have to raise your hand, but I will. I used to think people that did that were pieces of shit, lazy scumbags, until I actually had to go. And then I realized, wow, that's super ignorant and hateful and mean and deranged and narcissistic. That was a very narcissistic belief system because I'm superior. But am I? Am I superior? So facing this, this is what it felt like to go and ask for WIC, women and children. I was pregnant and had a baby and needed help. 
But I faced it. And you know what it did? It changed my political view almost instantly. Because I realized that, whoa, I got knocked into reality. Requires a sense of ability to handle loss. So how many of you have heard about efficacy? Efficacy. Again, that kind of has everything to do with a sense of ability, a sense of competence, a sense of esteem. So efficacy, you will hear more and more. There's physical efficacy. As an athlete, I'm very physically efficacious, right? As an intellect, can you learn? Can you learn hard things? Can you do hard things academically? Eventually, in practice, you realize, yeah, I can. How many of you are freshmen in here? Would you say you're developing efficacy right now? Academic efficacy? Like, oh, after your first semester, now you're here on your second semester, you're like, okay. Wait till you're sophomores and juniors. Then it really kicks in, and you're like, bring it, bring it. You kind of have a system. You know how to study. You know yourself. You know really kind of how it works. Right? Would you guys on the upper class would agree with that? You've developed academic efficacy. This requires failure efficacy. Please remember what I just said. The ability to handle failure. Can I experience failure and be okay? Not how can I avoid failure at all costs? That's the inflated state of narcissistic thinking. Right? How can I avoid failure at all costs? Which is really important when it comes to survival to think that way, right? Our survival isn't wired to be cool with failure. However, when it comes to, this comes back to perception of threat, how we perceive threat. How many of you are facing um, bear, bears daily? How many of you are scavenging for food in the forest? In the, right, how many of you are right now dying of drowning? Nope, not happening right now, right? How many, yeah, right, we're not really under threat at all but we perceive that threat. So how much of our perceptions of threat to survival, which ultimately equates to death, are not actually real, but they are conceived or conceptualized? Would it be advantageous to develop efficacy to handle failure? Like we were saying, what if you don't pass this class again? Four students failed last semester out of 32. So far, a pretty easy class, right? You just sit and listen. Take it multiple choice questionnaire test. I mean, if you don't fail, if you fail, what are you going to do? Can you handle failure? Can you handle if your significant other is cheating on you? I will ask you this question multiple times because I think, don't you agree and tell me if I'm wrong, that's kind of one of the most intimate, important, kind of if you get intimate with someone, not just emotionally, but physically, and you find out that they're doing the same thing with someone else. And someone you've bonded with, someone that has become part of your community. Tell me how that feels. If you got an envelope in the mail that says, Open if you want to know if your significant person is cheating on you. Would you open it? Think it through. Think it through because there's consequences to opening that. Could you handle it? And how would you handle it? Do you actually love this other person? Or are you just attached to them for your survival needs? Right? If you were attached to them to your survival needs, would it be easy to open that envelope? To face it? It would be really hard. It would be much easier to go into denial. Let's say you actually love and care about this human being. You really care about this person. Does that feel different than I need this person to validate my existence? Who am I without them? I want you guys to discuss this right here with me. Does it feel different to face the vulnerability of someone you actually care about, you care about their well-being, if they're ha developing a loving and sexual relationship with someone else, how do you feel about that and could you handle that? Let's go. You say no? 
I mean, it's my significant other was cheating on me. The thing is, is that I knew, like, we lived together, so I right. kind of depend on him for survival. Okay. Because okay. if he's cheating on me, I have to go to the house that isn't in his. So right. I have to find it out. So it would be more if, like, I got the info, if I was close to him, then I would have to. Yeah, you would need to face that reality. What, how would that reality change if the answer says, yes, he's developing um, feelings for someone else? How would the reality change? Uh, okay, right now I'm making know. you face this. <laughs> this is facing. How do you like it? I know <laughs> that isn't uh, that is survival working. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. And there's part of you that can't handle that. There is nothing wrong with that in any way. That's a reality, but you're facing it. That helps you get to know yourself, where your relationship is in and what your needs are. So I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back to what if you really care about this human being? Any of, any of you, reprocess it with that in mind versus attachment and survival. So change it a little bit. Anybody have a different reaction? Can I tell you, did you want to? Let's say you opened it and you found out that they are developing lovings and ha having important relationship with someone else. And how would I? Yeah, if you really cared and loved the person, meaning you care about their well-being versus attachment. See, there's a reason why I keep on saying you care about their well-being versus I need them for me. That's attachment. That's survival. I feel like it would change it in the way that like I would want them to be happy and if they're feeling like they're hurting or being in a relationship or they're not happy for some reason or they need, they need to go somewhere else for that, then I feel like it kind of takes the anger out of it. Mm -hmm. That's where I was taking you. That is not engaged in your survival. That's a different feeling, right? Because you care about their well-being. You, would, you wouldn't want them to be committed to you for your needs, even though there is compromise in all relationships, right? Your reaction is one of the uh, separation from survival. If there is a survival connection, it is much harder, it's more complicated. Doesn't mean it's not complicated if you're not attached survival-wise, right? Facing it helps you get to know this really where you're at and how you feel about the person. There's nothing wrong with saying, I will open that. And if they're cheating on me, bye bitches, they can go fuck themselves. There's nothing wrong with that answer either, because that ultimately tells you, you really don't care ultimately about their well being, And you're not engaging in that. You want to know that sooner than later. Right. And that you want to know in, in, in all honesty, does this relationship have really a future? Is this really meshing? Is this person been real with me? Or do they not know? And they're figuring themselves out. So it's, again, facing the response, you get a ton more information. Willingness to face the truth. Willingness to, to accept the truth is facing. Willingness to surrender to that reality. Grieving. Right? In that case, with the significant other you find out is cheating on you, but you really do care and love them as an individual separate from yourself. Could you remain, you know, roommates and still care about each other? Or is it too hard? There's nothing wrong with that answer either. Like if my husband, I've been married to him for 26 years. I have three children, all three of which are going to college. Like we're best friends at this point, clearly we're still married because I really, we like to be with each other. We like to hang out. I really like him separate from me and I have my separate life and he's got his shit going on. We really love to hang out. Um, 
if I found out he was cheating on me, I'd be devastated. I would be so mad. But I would also want what, if he's really needing to go out, go, go, go. I don't, I would still check up on him. I'd still, if I found out, for example, in five years he got cancer, I'd be there. I love him. I love him as a person. He's the father of my children. I'm devoted to him as a person, regardless of if we have sex or not, right? Um, that is not easy. To someone in survival mode, that would be really, really hard. Because in survival, you need edges. You need control. You need to, you need to make sure that they're not doing that because if they do that, then you're under threat, right? Because you're under threat anyways. You never, you ever really solved your third hierarchy of need anyways, right? So it's important to face those things. So you know where you're at without criticism and without judgment. It's okay. When I first got married, my husband went to a strip club with his brother and I was devastated. Devastated because he saw someone's titties. Right, I mean devastated because I felt really insecure with myself at the time. This was pre-suicidal ideation. Thick of mental health problems. And it was devastating because I didn't have a sense of myself. I didn't understand how we were actually uh, I didn't understand those black, I didn't, I needed it to be black and white. Those edges needed to be very clear because I was super insecure. I needed it to be black and white. And that was very gray territory for someone who is super insecure with my third hierarchy of need. Okay, kind of goes back to this. Um, this is complicated, I know. How many of you see this and it's like a big jumbled mess of emotion? The higher up you get, the more gray you can live in. The more willingness you are to face hardship, the more willingness you are to, to um, accept loss. I would say people who have failure efficacy move really high real fast. And the key with failure efficacy, meaning the capacity to handle loss and failure, um, is that you become more open-minded, you become more exploratory, you have more fun. Even in competition, you have more fun. Um, you are not so scared of the gray. The, again, you're not so triggered anymore. And so your biology changes. You're no longer dealing with cortisol out of control. You have control over those things to some degree, right? Because instead of being paranoid or being controlling, which is really cortisol and fight or flight promoted, you're more willing to talk and ask the questions and you're more willing to engage in a non-defensive and offensive way, meaning I'm going to fight, right, in how you relate. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to skip over that. Now we're getting into cognitive distortions. So this is how your brain perceives reality. And these have been studied for over 50 years, um, observing different levels, right? Of how we function under threat, how our minds function under threat. So we're going to go over these all or nothing thinking. How many of you have experienced that? Me too. <laughs> that is so amazing. I want you to think about where the benefit of all or nothing thinking is. Death is all or nothing. Let's just put that out there. You're not half dead, you're dead, right? You're either alive, big alive, right? Or you're not alive anymore. So when it comes to survival mechanisms, that's how it comes across is this is all or nothing. There is no gradient in between. So you either, in, in it's, um, so that can come across let's use dieting because I think a lot of people, how many of you here have tried restricting food in perfectly? No one has restricted perfectly, right. One minor mistake, over. That's all nothing. Exercise, how many of you have exercised thinking if I don't do, you know, this amount of cardio, 
I might as well not go today because if I can't get in an hour, it's not worth it. How many of you have thought that? Right. That's a survival mechanism. That means there's an attachment to exercise or dieting survival-wise. You want to know. That's not something to be ashamed of, but it is something to observe in yourself. If you're all or nothing about something, like they cheated on me or not, or I have to pass with an A, or I might as well get an F. How many of you have had that? If I don't get an A, I might as well not participate. These are common. Um, if my significant other is a, disappointed in me, they're going to leave me. Like all nothing. That is survival mode. I'm going to make sure I don't list all these. How we perceive change when survival mode is triggered. Survival mode requires a negative self-assessment. We've already gone through that. So cognitive distortions are those fast track. It's how the brain cheats and cuts corners to, it's a speed, it's actually um, a time-oriented thing. So jumping to conclusions, for example, well, let's see, what's next? Is that it? <gasps> I nailed it. Did I go through that too fast? We're on to the next slides. We still have 10 minutes. Oh, my God. I'm going to pause this really quick. The first thing we do is Turn these moods around. And I started out like many young I'm going to speed it up. I started out at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. I finished my residency and I did a research fellowship on the country. And I was always very anxious to find why do we fall into these black holes? What's the cause of it? What can we do to turn these moods around? And I started out like many young psychiatrists. What they call biological psychiatrists. I was doing research on brain chemistry, this idea of depression and anxiety, these all kind of chemical imbalance in the brain. I was treating patients with antidepressants and other medications. But there were only two problems from my point of view. The first is our own research. The research we did didn't seem to confirm that depression or anxiety were actually due to a chemical imbalance in the brain. In fact, our research indicated that this probably is not the cause of depression and anxiety. In addition, I was giving them antidepressants by the bucket full to patients. I had hundreds of patients, and all a few of them were getting help. Most of them were not. They were going on week after week, saying, I want to die, I feel worthless. And I said, gosh, there's got to be a better way. If the pills had worked, I would have been perfectly, perfectly happy. And I thought, maybe there's some type of psychotherapy I could combine with the medications, because I wanted people to be able to wake up and say, it's great to be alive. And, I have joy and full of love and full of life, and I was weary of saying that. And I tried different kinds of psychotherapy that didn't seem to work. And then a colleague said, You know, there's something new fellow here at Penn is developing, Aaron Eck, and he calls it cognitive therapy. And it's kind of simple in its theory. And maybe you could try this out with some of your, your patients. And the con a cognition is a thought, it's just a fancy word for a thought. And there's three basic ideas behind cognitive therapy. The first is that our thoughts, create all of our moods. And that when you're depressed and anxious, you're giving yourself negative messages. You're blaming yourself. You're telling yourself something terrible is going to happen. Now, this idea is not new. It goes back to the Greek philosopher Epictetus. Nearly 2,000 years ago, he said people are disturbed not by things, in other words, not by the events of our life, but by the views we take of them. That we create all of our emotions, positive and negative, at every moment of every day through our interpretations of what's going on. And it goes back even before Epictetus to the Buddha, who was saying the same thing 2,500 years ago. Well, the second idea is that when you're depressed and anxious, those negative thoughts, I'm no good, I'm a loser, what's wrong with me, I shouldn't have screwed up, I should be better than I am, those thoughts are not realistic thoughts. They're distorted. That depression and anxiety are the world's oldest cause, so that there's 10 distortions that you always see in the negative thoughts of individuals who are depressed and anxious, like all or nothing thinking, if I'm not a great success today, I'll be a total failure. Shades of gray don't exist, or overgeneralization, seeing a negative event as a never-ending pattern of defeat, or should statements, or self-blame. And the third idea was that you could train people to change the way they think, and then suddenly change the way they feel. Well, I heard that theory, and I said, that sounds like so much bullshit. Uh, I know my, my patients have negative thoughts, that's certainly the case, but you can't help serious suicidal depression with some kind of power of positive thinking. 
And I told him, I like this. He says, well, David, why don't you go to the next weekly seminar? And as part of your research, try this with the field of your toughest patients, and then you can prove to yourself that it doesn't work. And I thought, that's a, that's a great idea. I think I'll check it out. Well, the first patient I tried it out was a woman referred from the intensive care unit of the university hospital. She had made a near, nearly successful suicide attempt. An elderly Latvian immigrant, and they referred her to me for follow-up. And I, I said, Martha, there's, there's this new form of therapy I'm, I'm doing some uh, investigating, and, and would it be okay if I present your case at this uh, weekly seminar? And then I can tell you what they say, and maybe we can find some new, new techniques. And she was fine with that. She gave me permission. So I presented her case to Dr. Beck and said, but how, how do you use the cognitive therapy with someone who's suicidal? And he said, well, our thoughts create all of our emotions. So just ask her, what were you telling yourself the moment you tried to commit suicide? So I went back to her, and I said, well, what were you? She said, what did you find out in the seminar? I said, well, I'm supposed to ask you what you were telling yourself the moment you attempted suicide, what were your negative thoughts? And she said, oh, I was telling myself that I'm a worthless human being because I've never accomplished anything meaningful or significant in my life. And she said, now what, what am I supposed to do about that? And I said, I, I'm not sure you have to wait a week. You know, go back and ask at the seminar. So I went back and said, you know, here's what I found out, what should I do? And Dr. Beck said, well, one technique we use is called Examine the evidence to see if what you're telling yourself is, is true, true or not. Ask her to make a list of several things she has accomplished. I thought, hmm, that, that makes sense. So I went back and I said, she said, what did you find out at the seminar? I said, you're, well, you're supposed to make a list of several things you have accomplished. She said, well, that's just the problem. Uh, I can't think of anything. And I don't know, maybe some of you folks felt that way sometimes. Look back on your life and say, what have I done that was really meaningful, that was really significant? What did my life really amount to? So I said, well, why don't you take it as a homework assignment? Maybe maybe you can think of something. Well, the next week, I forgot I gave her the homework assignment. I did my usual nonspecific schmoozing and how are you feeling and do you need a refill on the antidepressant and this type of thing. And halfway through the session, she said, well, aren't you going to ask me about my homework? I said, oh, I forgot. But did you come up with anything? And she handed me a list of about, oh, seven or eight things that she had accomplished during her life. And the first one, she said, I overlooked the fact that um, I, I smuggled my children out of Nazi Germany. My husband died in the concentration camps. My, all of our relatives died, died in the concentration camps, but I got the children out, and we made it to America. And I worked scrubbing floors and cleaning people's houses to keep food on the table and to keep a, a, a roof over our head. And this week, my son just graduated first in his class from the Harvard Business School. And that, well, maybe that's an accomplishment. <laughs> and then she said, and I forgot that I speak five languages fluently. And I'm going, I shan't, but she had all these amazing things. And I said, Martha, how do you reconcile this with your claim that you're a worthless human being who's never accomplished anything meaningful? And she said, Dr. Burns, it doesn't be true. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know how I could have been thinking that. And I said, how are you feeling now? She said, I'm feeling a lot better. She said, do you have any more techniques? I said, no, that's the only one I've learned so far. You have to wait till next week. You know, I'll learn another technique. And so that's how it began to melt. And I began to see patient after patient. And I've been in touch with some patients who said that they've been depressed, had failed therapy for more than 50 years. Some who said they never had one moment of happiness in their entire life. Suddenly experienced joy and self-esteem and I said, this, this is the thing I want to commit my life to. I had just received a grant from the government, a five-year grant to develop a brain chemistry research laboratory at the medical school. And I sent the money back. And I said, I don't want to spend my life doing research on a theory that's not going to bear fruit. This is what I want to do. And then the research began to come in. First, a pilot study of PAN that showed that this new form of therapy was as effective, if not more effective, than the best antidepressant drugs. And then study after study has come in, and now it's become the most researched form of psychotherapy in history. We all got excited, and Dr. Beck said, David, would you like to co-author the manual that we're writing for therapists so people can learn how to do this new form of therapy? And I said, you know, we've got enough people, Brian Shaw, Gary Emery, and others, that we can co-author that book for you. I think my calling is to write the manual for the patients and for the general public to show people, give them tools to begin to use these tools in their own lives and maybe patients could read the book between sessions to accelerate their, their recovery. 
the, uh, so then I wrote the book, Feeling Good. Another research came along, a fellow at the University of Alabama uh, began to do some research on what is the fastest and most inexpensive way to treat people with depression. And he did some research I was unaware of. He took people coming to the University of Alabama asking for therapy for severe depression and said, you've got to be on a waiting list. Okay, basically he says cognitive behavioral therapy, it by far is more impactful than medication. I am not anti-medication, but this, if you look it up, it's, it's a big deal. So the whole point of cognitive behavioral therapy and the techniques is to face what you believe because your beliefs about yourself and about reality and how you compare those two together ultimately can trigger biological reactions that can distort reality, meaning like jumping to conclusions. I, that's what they did. And then, um, and you can believe it and then you act on it and you look like an asshole because you believe that someone was doing something and you assumed you were correct. And now you act on that. And those actions can have harmful impact to you and to other people. How, what you believe about yourself can directly impact how you see reality. And ultimately what they found with people with diet, uh, depression and anxiety is there, there have high degrees of cognitive distortions. Their reality is completely distorted and it's ultimately promoting and sustaining and maintaining a really low level of, this, um, of consciousness. So facing can change everything. Okay, so I'm going to see you guys on Monday. There is homework assignment. It's up. It's loaded. Take a read. And it's due on Monday. Okay, we'll see you guys on Monday.